Hi, I'm Scott Kikawa, and today I am at home, just like the rest of you. Usually, even during this strange time, I'm at work, because I'm considered to be one of those essential people. But my employer, the United States of America, has decided that while I was essential yesterday, and will be essential again tomorrow, that today I am not. So, lucky me. I wrote a book. It's called Kona Winds. And the title is a reference to the weather, not to the place. I get a lot of questions about that, but if you're from here, you probably already knew that. I wrote it, and it was published by Bamboo Ridge Press. If you're watching this video, then you probably already know that for over 40 years, Bamboo Ridge has been known for its excellent local literary fiction and poetry. I consider myself to be extremely lucky that Bamboo Ridge decided to do my book because I am neither an author, or author of literary fiction nor a poet, but I am a guy that writes detective stories, and that's what Kona Wins is, it's a detective story. It's set in 1953. I'm going to read you a short excerpt. Hopefully it'll help you pass a little of the time. And if it sounds antiquated, if the language sounds antiquated, then good. It's supposed to. And I'm going to read it in what I call detective monotone. So excuse the droning, but it's the voice I envision that this should be read in. So here's a short excerpt from Kona Winds. As soon as I pulled into the back of the gray corrugated tin structure, I was hit by the charnel odor. It was the smell of burnt hair, old blood, shit, and death. Slaughterhouse smell. Dead animals. Nothing in the world smelled worse except the battlefield. It reminded me of Wally's septic stump where his leg had once been, and the awful smell of the infirmary tent where I had visited him before they shipped him stateside. We'd play cards as I sat in an empty ammunition can next to his cot. We didn't talk about girls anymore. The subject always made him cry. Who's going to want me, Frankie? He'd ask. I told him that leg or no leg, he was still better looking than Mitz Kuroda and a better dancer, too. Wally laughed, but I think it was more to make me feel better and less guilty. The silver Buick Roadmaster was parked with its lights off just where Cadiz said it would be. I could see him sitting behind the wheel. Cautiously, I scanned the back lot visually and couldn't make out any movement. The place was littered with worn shipping pallets and partially rusted oil drums, with one word painted in white on them, inedible. I took the hip flask out of the glove compartment and had a quick drink. It had cooled down considerably since the afternoon, but the liquor still tasted like turpentine. I lit a cigarette and got out of my car. The air was still and warm, and my neck started sweating as soon as I shut the door. There was an eerie silence except for the buzzing of flies and the oil drums. I approached the roadmaster with my hand in my jacket resting on the butt of the thirty-eight. Danny boy, I called out in an attempt to get Cadiz's attention. Cadiz ignored me. I walked right up to the open driver's window and was about to speak again when I saw the dark stain on the passenger's side on the white leather up upholstery. Danny Boy Cadiz's handsome face was tilted up and his eyes stared blankly at his windshield. His mouth hung half open. A burnt hole graced his left temple. His right was gone, splattered no doubt all over the roadmaster's interior. Shit, I said. I made my way back to the Cadillac with leaden feet and reached for the radio. Then I stood in the yellowish floodlight of the parking area adjacent to the small, empty stockyard. I saw a pair of mismatched tire tracks that looked like the ones I saw on Sheridan Tract in front of the Miyasaki place. They led away from the empty space next to the roadmaster toward the street. There wasn't much else except for the stench of dead things. Twenty minutes must have passed before the first prowler arrived. I went through three cigarettes and nearly emptied my flask of paint stripper waiting around. In an hour, the place was crawling with olive drab police uniforms. Gid Hanohano and Jack Morris were the last attendees to arrive at Danny Boy Cadiz's going-away party. It didn't matter. 
I was the first one to get there, and I was late myself. Danny Boy had already shoved off with Karen to cross the Acheron, and nobody was there to say bon voyage except the one who pulled the trigger and put him on the ferry. Gid shuffled up to me with the same apparent lack of urgency with which he did everything. It wasn't really that he moved slowly. He just looked as if he did. It was probably that way with all large objects. The earth completes an entire rotation in a mere 24 hours, but often the day seems to drag. He stopped a few paces in front of me and handed me a cigar. It's not one of your fancy Cubans, but it's better than smelling this. This whole place stinks like about 20 kills or more. Thanks, I told him. I think it's more like 50 or more, but the other 49 were pigs, and now they're in your morning Portuguese sausage. The one in the Buick was my informant. Oh, said Gid. I could almost hear his eyebrow raise as he said it. I puffed away and told Gid and Jack about what had transpired at the Royal Hawaiian. Both of them listened thoughtfully. Interesting, was all Gid said, pondering again. I just had Freda's sausage this morning with my eggs, said Jack. I don't think I'll be having it tomorrow morning. It's tomorrow morning right now, I said wearily. Gid blinked and rubbed his forehead. Long night, he said to me. Yeah, long night. What do you think Danny Boy was going to show you? I raised my tired eyes without thinking to look through the chain-link fence that separated the sausage factory lot from the warehouse lot next door. Holy shit, there it was. That, I told Gid, and pointed to the warehouse next door, a large nondescript tin-covered box with a hand-painted sign above the door reading DHM3. So that was a short excerpt from Kona Winds. Uh, it was only a few minutes long. I hope it helped you to pass about five minutes of your confinement. Uh, it was a an excerpt I selected on the suggestion of Wing Tech Lum, who had been to a lot of my readings, and I had done a lot of the same excerpts. And Wing suggested that I read something uh, that included the discovery of a corpse. So uh, there it is, and uh, and. That was for Wing and for anybody else who had already attended my readings. Uh, it was something I don't believe that I had already done before. Um, apologies if that wasn't uh, inspiring or uh, encouraging. Uh, I know that a lot of the other videos in this series are meant to be just that, but I write crime fiction, and crime fiction is rarely uplifting. What I hope it is, though, uh, is entertaining, and I hope that in small some small sense that I brought some entertainment uh, to your um, to your cramped existence right now. Um, anyway, stay healthy, stay safe, and above all, stay inside. Bye.